On Thursday, February 25th, Hasbro, of which Wizards of the Coast has become its own division of, announced a slew of new details about the future of Magic the Gathering. Among these details, which included the fact that Wizards of the Coast is so profitable that it makes more money for Hasbro than all its toy businesses, was the revelation of what is being called Universes Beyond which will be everything from commander decks to complete sets featuring characters and settings from other brands. The first two products announced are a series of Warhammer 40k commander decks and a Lord of the Rings complete Magic the Gathering set. These new, exclusive cards will be considered no different than any other real Magic the Gathering card and will be fully legal in all Eternal formats, including Commander and Legacy. They will be, in all ways, just regular magic cards, only with characters and worlds that are not from Magic the Gathering. This is not a one-time thing, but a new beginning of a series of regular supplements such as these. In addition to this, there were other striking details of ways that Magic the Gathering is moving beyond what it was, notably moving beyond the local game store model into a greater direct-to-consumer sales system and a thematic expansion beyond fantasy. Now that last part was vague and could very well be under the tent pole of Wizards of the Coast creating new games entirely, but given it was also combined with the rollout of Universes Beyond, it could very well imply that Magic the Gathering itself may offer a few sets that deviate outside of straight fantasy within its own prime worlds. Does that mean sci-fi Kamigawa? Cowboy Jace? That remains to be seen, but Warhammer Commander decks and Lord of the Rings as a complete set are confirmed with mechanically unique cards featuring those brands' IP and many more brand crossovers to come regularly. Magic the Gathering is moving beyond just being Magic the Gathering. In many ways, I have already made this video, as this change to Magic the Gathering actually began with Secret Lair, The Walking Dead, and I have a video on that. In that video, I did not say Magic was dead or dying because of Secret Lair, The Walking Dead, but I did say this is what Magic is now, and it seems I was right. The Walking Dead crossover was not an experiment or aberration. It was the start of a change in the very nature of Magic the Gathering's flavor. Universes Beyond is not a new thing. It is simply the continuation of what Secret Lair Walking Dead began, only continuing on a much, much larger scale. And again, before we go on, I am not saying Magic is dead or dying. In fact, it's making more money than ever. But what I am saying is that, as it has always done, Magic the Gathering is changing and I am reacting to those changes. You do not have to agree with me, but I ask, as always, that you at least respect that my opinions and my feelings are sincere. Indeed, there are a lot of strong feelings wrapped up in this. For those, like myself, who are deeply unhappy over these changes, I urge you not to misdirect that anger and frustration at any players who feel happy or excited for these crossovers. If you are happy and you are excited for Universes Beyond, then that's great. I want people to be happy, and I want people to enjoy their hobbies. As much as I do not like this, I will never, ever begrudge you your own joy, and I will always get games of Commander with you, regardless of whether or not you run these new magic cards in your deck. Universes Beyond does not change this. I'm happy people are happy, and I love Magic the Gathering, and I will never, ever be toxic towards someone else because of their love for Magic the Gathering, even if they are finding joy in something that... I personally don't like. It is okay for our opinions to differ on this. We are allowed to love different things. That's what makes life interesting. But in that same right, people who do feel unhappy or frustrated or even don't feel like playing Magic the Gathering anymore should not be attacked so long as they themselves are not being toxic. 
People have that right to feel unhappy, to feel like moving on to play something else. It's a game. You are allowed to say you don't enjoy it anymore without being mocked or having the sincerity of your feelings questioned. <sighs> Can we, you know, all of us just stop mocking people over opinions on a hobby card game? Stop attacking each other over a highly divisive decision Wizards of the Coast made. So, I want to talk about why do many Magic the Gathering players, myself included, not like this. While many Magic the Gathering players are upset over universes beyond breaking their immersion in the Magic world, the main problem is that Wizards of the Coast is again pushing towards offering mechanically unique cards outside of regular Magic sets, often in an exclusive system such as Secret Layers or other limited or hard-to-get means. What's more, due to rights issues, these cards will likely be next to impossible to reprint, creating a new version of the reserve list. Imagine the impact when there's cards as good in Commander as Cyclonic Rift or Smothering Tithe in those Warhammer Commander decks. Remember, these Universe Beyond cards will be legal in Eternal formats, including but not limited to Commander and Legacy. Not only will Universes Beyond cards not be Silver Border and will not have the Akoria skin treatment, Wizards of the Coast specifically said that they did not want to pursue those methods. As I see it, the reasoning for this ties directly into a lot of people's concerns for the Universes Beyond cards, the idea that you need these cards. If these cards had been Silver Border, or even better yet, just done in the style and same manner as the Akoria Godzilla skin cards, just Bonus cards in a regular standard set that are an alternate art and name of an existing card, well, that would have negated all of these problems, negated all of these criticisms, negated all of these bad feelings. Not one person, myself included, would have had a problem with them using that method. But that's exactly why Wizards of the Coast did not want to do this, because then we could just ignore them if we wanted to. Hey, that doesn't sell product. It needs to be something you can't ignore, something you will miss out on if you do not buy. You can try and ignore Warhammer cards all you want, but when some of them are as important to your gameplay as Ristic Study or Smothering Tithe, then you can't really ignore them. You also kind of have to run them, and there's no alternate that you can run in their place, and thus you will feel compelled to buy the product to get the cards lest you miss out and be forced to pay exorbitant amounts through the secondary sellers. And that is the number one issue with this, but I feel the frustrations with outside IP and its immersion-breaking effects are very important as well. By breaking the immersion of Magic the Gathering in this way, you are changing it, changing the game fundamentally and forever. A bad faith argument that has been put forward by Wizards of the Coast has been that blocking Emrakul with a squirrel that is equipped with lightning greaves is essentially the same as equipping Lucille to Iron Man and having him block an attacking Monopoly Man. That is not only wrong, it is actively deceptive. The squirrel, Emrakul, the magical lightning greaves, they are all from Magic the Gathering worlds that share the same constant of being Magic the Gathering Worlds. Whether on Innistrad or Ravnica or Tarkir, the flavors of these worlds may change from horror to magical city to dragons, but they are still within the larger construct of the Magic the Gathering game and world. None of these worlds, for example, have Honda Accords on them or in their art or a B-52 bomber. None of them have classic flying saucers with little green men. Why? Because even within Magic the Gathering's premise of the multiverse, there's a larger binding aesthetic that makes this game distinct. Not just a fantasy aesthetic, but Magic the Gathering's specific fantasy aesthetic. Things it does and things it does not do. When you create viable game pieces with no Magic-themed counterpart, whether it's a Darth Vader card, or a Furby card, or a Tigtone card, you irrevocably change the fundamental flavor 
of the game, breaking the Magic the Gathering immersion as it has been meticulously maintained for over 25 years. This is not isolated to these products. This is not just a fun, separate thing Magic is doing so that those who enjoy it can go enjoy it and those who do not, do not have to. This is changing the very essence of what the game of Magic the Gathering is, because these will be real Magic cards and have names and artworks from things other than Magic the Gathering, but with no Magic the Gathering counterpart. And never mind the dire possibilities of any of these new cards being pushed or broken, because with this large and regular volume, it is inevitable that many of these cards will become format staples, and those staples will become part of eternal formats like Commander and Legacy. And since Universes Beyond is now a regular part of the product line, these Magic cards featuring other brands will just continue and grow. And in a few years' time, yeah, Gandalf equips Captain America's shield to block Lego Batman. And there is a difference between a world in Magic the Gathering being inspired by Greek myth versus literally just putting that Greek myth in the world. In Theros, we do not have Zeus or Athena or Poseidon. We instead took the myth and created something new, something that was a part of Magic the Gathering. And I feel that had I gone back to original Theros and asked Mark Rosewater, hey, why not just make a Zeus card? He would have explained to me the value in keeping Magic's IP, well, about Magic. And not just in an artistic sense. Here he is, from around that time, actually explaining that, yeah, if we were to create non-Magic IP cards, crossover cards, well, that's going to affect those other formats like Legacy and Commander. Not a good move, says past Mark, but now we are transforming Magic the Gathering into an IP crossover game. Because when you sit down to get those games, you will be submerged in IP crossovers after a short while. And I feel there are legitimate reasons for players not to want to have to sit down to that experience. Even if I choose not to play with the new Shrek or Furby card, the fact that my games of Magic will be filled with them is going to be immersion-breaking. And that's something that disappoints a lot of the audience. It's why you even heard people who were fans of The Walking Dead saying they didn't want The Walking Dead secret lair. We lose something when it becomes that. Something important. It's why Luke Skywalker doesn't just take out a Star Trek phaser and blast his enemies with it, or fly off the planet inside of a TARDIS. Maybe these are cool and fun images for a fan to create, but you don't want it in the actual movie. There's no problem with me individually getting my card altered to look like Shrek, but you don't want the actual card in your magic set to be that. Furthermore, while we are bringing Warhammer characters and ideas into Magic, I wonder about the reverse. I wonder if Warhammer will be creating models of Planeswalkers like Jace and Gideon, Nyssa and Chandra as part of their main game. And I wonder if those models will be, I, I don't know what the Warhammer equivalent of pushed is, but I wonder if those models will be made so good that they essentially were must-includes for a competitive army list. Want to lead your Space Marines, I believe, into battle? Well, better bring along Jace. I don't think Warhammer will do this, and I don't think they should. And yet here we are doing that in Magic. If this is such a good decision, why isn't Warhammer just bringing in our characters as must-runs in their game. I find it telling that in all these announcements, absolutely nothing was said of actual gameplay. It's just collector's pieces to buy and own. They say that The Walking Dead Secret Lair brought in so many new players to the game, but did it bring in people to play that game or just buy the pieces to collect and own? But I suppose the money made via Secret Layers selling Magic as a collectible and not competitive game is just astonishingly high. And so we are moving beyond organized play. And moving beyond local game stores, which of course we already knew they were. Even before the pandemic, we knew they were doing this when they did things like end their direct sales programs, diminish Friday Night Magic, and paper organized play. Strixhaven will be the first pre-release where you can't get draft booster boxes at. Only set booster boxes. The draft boosters will come 
later. And they will be there just in a smaller number and allocation. Magic the Gathering is moving away from draft. It's moving away from the local game store. To be clear, Wizards of the Coast did issue a correction where they wanted to emphasize that they didn't mean to imply they were leaving local game stores behind entirely, simply expanding their model beyond just the LGS, with particular emphasis on that idea of online sales and direct sales like Secret Layers, where they want to be able to offer more products that way, direct to consumer, without the local game store. But they'll, they'll still be there. More direct online sales, a lot more crossovers, and less of the local game store. Or, to put it simply, less magic, less gathering. The game is about something else now. Secret layers have sold more than you can imagine. And The Walking Dead secret layer sold most of all. This is not a one-time thing. This is not an experiment. This is the result. And that's why I didn't even really want to make a video about this. Because what is there left to say? This is magic now.